Hello, fellow Americans. My name is Eric Strauss. I'm running for president in 2020. I'm also known as host Eric of Talking with Famous People. And that's where this video is being published. So I'm going to talk tonight as I am plan to and am following through on this, providing an update every day on the candidacy. And usually it's going to be a policy update as I complete this platform about what sort of political thinking I'm bringing to the table and also what sort of agenda you can expect from me as president. So I do have a considerable interest in smart environmental legislation. I believe that the federal government has a role to play in protecting the environment. Preserve open spaces, parks, nature reserves, and so forth for sure. If it hasn't been exploited yet or developed or whatever, then we can leave it alone by and large. There's, if, if it's federal land, let's not mess with the parks. They're great. There are many le legitimate instances. I'm sorry, one sentence back. I'm interested in seeing the EPA and Forest Service merge. I'm not opposed to the EPA as a branch of, as a, as a agency under the executive branch that does affect the environment. However, I don't necessarily think that that should be separate from the Forest Service. There's a sense that Environmental Protection Agency is somehow the sciencey part of environmental protection, and the Forest Service is somehow, you know, making sure you, the picnickers don't feed the bears or something. But really, the EPA needs to embed its its mission in the the land of the country, and so I'd love to see those two merge. Regardless. There are many legitimate instances in which property rights can be con correctly constrained by a federal government that represents the nation's interest in sustaining wild spaces, flora, fauna, and waterways. However, the EPA must not pursue any agenda that transgresses upon those rights without a careful and conservative calculus regarding the significance of the preservation goal and the imposition upon the citizen, erring towards citizen rights when it's a closed decision. This is one of those things where it's a tricky matter to deal with as a policy issue because there's going to be some gray area at the edge. It's not exactly a clear principled thing that you can apply binary in a binary fashion. There's going to have to be some judgment calls here. So I just want to assert and affirm and assure the American people of my position on the environment. I will be a friend of the environment. I like environmental regulation when it works well, and I think it's necessary. So, however, one area in which a lot of people who probably would side with me on my environmental policies might differ is on climate change. There's a sense amongst a lot of people, I suspect, that either you support strong efforts to deal with climate change, or you're a climate change denier, or not, not using science, or not caring, not being somehow dismissive of the value of the environment, that if you really cared about it, surely you'd do something with this terrible climate change. So I want to explain in great detail, in, in thorough reasoning analysis, not great detail, but I want to explain exactly why I oppose and will not participate in any sort of climate change um, treaties. Reject attempting to solve climate change. I oppose entering into any treaties, agreements, or other commitments to lower the emission of carbon. I do affirm that global warming is real and anthropogenic and has harms. I negate the notion that carbon reduction makes sense for several distinct reasons. First, costs outweigh benefits. A reduction on carbon means a reduction on the output of industry. It's a direct constraint on economic growth and prosperity. While we, while we can be sure of the economic harms of constraining industry, industry output like that, we can also be sure that reducing carbon will not fix anything. The best case scenario in the carbon reduction plan sees us making this concerted sacrifice only to slow the speed at which a problem that's already existent worsens. Alternatives are preferable carbon strategies. So one alternative is sequestration and some sort of technical sequestration. That means pulling the carbon that's already in the atmosphere out and burying it under the ground. It can be attained through multiple means and it does not have an impact on the economy as a whole. It just has the economic impact of the cost of the sequestration. So instead of harming the engine of the economy in order to solve this problem, 
sequestration says, let's leave the engine in the economy alone and try to get it on the back end. It's a smarter way to do it, especially since sequestration or carbon emission reductions not are going to solve the problem. They just make it less bad as they make it bad happen later. So alternatives may be preferable, but they're not a solution either, just to be clear about that. Iron seeding is an alternative. Uh, we can we can seed iron dust in the Antarctic Ocean in areas where there are mineral deficiencies, and it causes large algae blooms to happen. And an ancillary benefit of that is that those areas of the ocean gain new ecosystems of life and such like that. The algae absorbs a bunch of carbon. It goes into the the things that eat the algae. It's basically biological carbon sequestration. Another form of biological carbon sequestration is to increase sea otter populations artificially. We'd have to pump a bunch of sea otters into the ocean, but they will reduce sea urchin populations, which increases global kelp forests, which global kelp forests are actually responsible for absorbing a substantial amount of carbon that gets absorbed by plants on Earth. So the third reason why we shouldn't enter into any of these treaties is we don't know what the carbon temperature curve looks like. We're advocating policy on this as though it were linear, and we knew it were linear. Uh, it, we don't know that, and I've never heard anybody claim to the contrary. And I have, I have read um, science that suggests that the question is open-ended. So, I mean, the question is open, not open-ended. It's open. It hasn't been resolved. Additional carbon might be subject to diminishing returns then. So if it's subject to diminishing returns, if it's linear, we put in one bucket of, of carbon into the atmosphere, we get one unit of extra heat. Then we bump up another, another bucket of carbon in the atmosphere, another unit of extra heat. But if it's diminishing returns, at first you bump one unit of carbon in the atmosphere, you get five units of heat. And then gradually you put one unit of carbon in the atmosphere, you get 0 0.01 units of heat. So that's a different line, a different curve, a different concern. How important is carbon if it's a diminishing returns curve? Not at all. Why would we want to reduce emissions? At least not for global warming. The other factor is negative feedback loops. Now, in general, the scientists agree, and I agree it makes sense this would be the case, that they are insufficient in and of themselves to counteract warming effects. One negative feedback loop is when it's warmer, plants grow more, so they absorb more carbon. But the problem is, we don't know if the math on those loops is scalar. So we don't know if, while well, it may work that way in on a small scale in a, in a few variable system, it may not work that way globally. So we don't know that. And it's something we ought to know before we make firm decisions about what we're going to do. We should know if it's going to work for lots of reasons. The last reason is, is black swans. The last reason I'm presenting here as to why we shouldn't enter these treaties is black swans. These kind of problems um, global food production or global climate change, uh, lots of sorts of problems. Global information uh, infrastructure. They're solved by black swans. One thing comes here that renders everything moot, everything else moot. For example, we're having a lot of drought here in California, and there's a lot of worrying about whether you should use water or not. Well, I proposed that what we ought to do if we're going to use government infrastructure is pump seawater at everybody's house. Cap that seawater pump uh, and just leave it. Let the free market take care of everything else. Before you know it, so many people in California would have that thing uncapped, attach a desalinator that they bought from, the, from a private company, and pretty soon they'd have their own fresh water that's been desalinated at their house. Now, the government didn't put this program into action. They just pumped the seawater and capped it. Let people and the free market decide what to do. Pretty soon, we don't have any more drought in California. Because everybody's desalinating their own water. We don't have to build a big desalination plant because everybody does it themselves. This is the sort of thing that we need to start thinking about when we're talking about public policy. A black swan is something that renders everything else before it moot. If I were concerned about the, the serious problem of buggy whips that are breaking and injuring horses, and I'm working hard on legislation to deal with that, and then the automobile is invented. I don't, my legislation is pointless. The problem's gone away. Nobody's using buggy whips anymore. And we didn't need to solve it the way we thought we did. So that's why I don't want and don't believe that we ought to enter into any treaties regarding carbon 
emission reductions. I, I also present this as an example of how I believe politics should proceed forward and that the, the country would be a lot better off if we could proceed forward in this fashion. What I've shown here is that there's two things. I'm a big protector of the environment. I believe in environmental regulation. And concurrently, I'm very interested in making sure it, it imposes or transgresses upon the citizen as little as possible. And concurrently, I'm deeply opposed to a carbon emissions or carbon tax or anything like that. And if you are somebody who's normally is accustomed to determining whether a candidate is somebody you like or not based on where they stand on this issue or that issue or the other issue, then I'm presenting you something a lot more complicated than that. I'm saying, if you're a Democrat and you like environmental regulation, vote for me because I do favor environmental regulation and I will make sure it's actually purposeful. If you're a Republican, and you don't like environmental regulation, vote for me. Because I will make sure that people's rights are protected. And while I do support environmental regulation as a general rule, I don't support it when it's not adequately established that the, the legislation or the action we take is going to actually solve the problem. Just because we can describe a problem very effectively, just because we can talk about how significant the problem is, doesn't mean that doing something about it is a good idea. That's a separate calculus, and there are many occasions when doing something about it is either a pointless thing to do or actually makes the problem worse. So being realistic about the way systems work and how to calculate our decision-making is critically important. And what I am bringing to the table as a candidate is that understanding and my interest in bridging the differences between groups who align themselves on one side of an issue or another side of the issue who want to say, that group's bad, no, that group's bad. I'm not interested in doing any of that, and I believe that the country would be much better off if we can simply articulate the specifics of why again policy is better, why again policy is not going to work, and try to be reasonable about that stuff. Thanks for watching. Uh, if there's anybody in the room who'd like to, to talk about anything about this or ask me a question or something like that, I really would like this political process to be more engaged with actual people talking to me as an actual person than the current political process. Sure, I have a question. Um, so how would you go about determining if a particular policy uh, or legislation would be effective or not on the environment? Who would you consult with? Who would you ask? How, how would those you know sort of things be determined? But I think environmental regulation had to do with basically three main areas of things which is water pollution or water water cleanliness, air cleanliness, and ecosystem stuff. So if you've got, I, I'm a believer that we should prevent smog, for example, if we can. Now, California has a lot of regulation in place regarding air quality. And while I find it sometimes rather oppressive, I recognize the fact that when I was a child living in Los Angeles, smog was much, much worse. And we'd have third stage smog alerts. And this, the teachers at school would say, you have to go inside during recess. You can't go play outside. Nobody wanted to because your chest hurt it. Your chest hurt and your eyes stung. Smog's gotten a lot better in Los Angeles. It's still bad around here, but it's very tolerable. I've also spent time working for three months in Shanghai. And I know what pollution is like over there, where the government is not attending to environmental regulation. They're always prioritizing the economic aspect of things. So the how do you know if it's effective? Well, good environmental regulation stops people from polluting. If you, it, it doesn't, or it, it either stops people from polluting, or it makes it such that some technology or aspect of life that always pollutes, pollutes less. Now, for water water quality, I absolutely believe that re environmental regulation that says don't dump stuff in the water, I don't need to establish that that's going to be effective in preventing toxic waste from being important to the water. Those are the kind of legislation, legislative acts that I think are appropriate. I don't 
nobody needs to convince me that we should prevent people from pouring toxic waste into the river. Nobody needs to convince me that that'll solve the problem. Nobody needs to convince me that if we allow endless amounts of drilling offshore, that there are going to be accidents. There will be accidents. But also, nobody needs to convince me that we need the resources. So it's in areas of environmental protection, it's a matter of competing interests. Different areas of policy are different metrics as far as what we ought to use. Environment has to be competing interests because of the diffuse nature of the transgression, the diffuse nature of the responsibility, and the diffuse nature of the harm. That didn't exactly answer your question, but I, I tried my best. Well, I think you definitely answered at least part of it, but um, yeah, I mean, you answered it. I mean, the other part would be part of the legislative branch and how they, they need to determine if a particular uh, legislation would be effective. Like, basically, my question is, at what point did, would you, is the is the line where you would say, well, this is too polluting or this is, you know, okay, acceptable well, pollution, but we get this economic benefit. Like, the, you, there's a balance there, and I'm just wondering how those things are to be balanced. Okay, well, one of the key factors in the balancing is, is the thing in the in the environment in the status quo, is it in our, our society in the status quo is a entrenched thing? If it is, then we can try to mitigate the harms of that thing, but we oughtn't rip it out if it's important. So, like when D, when DDT it was determined was causing all this environmental damage, they banned it. I agree with that decision. One of the the lines that has to be drawn though is not so much exactly. We don't have to have a clear, bright line uh, protocol that we use to determine when is it too much damage. You know, how do we it's always going to be a, a matter of discretion in some to some extent. The more interesting question is actually, when can the EPA functionally affect policy without legislation from Congress? In other words, how large is the scope of the authority afforded the EPA by Congress's creation of the EPA? That's a, a much more challenging and interesting question. And I think that's going to be something I'll address in my jurisprudence section. Or talk about judicial activism and the the critical importance that we get judges to start returning to the plain language of the law that they're interpreting, plain meaning of the words. Well, uh, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that point up. That is a good question. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear the answer to that. But I, I do I do appreciate your position on it because there's not many people that have a position which is reasonable. Like they they make it a dichotomy and they. I mean, they do do the thing where they say, you know, if you if you uh, don't support all this, all these policies on, uh, you know, reducing carbon emissions and, and and things like that, like excessive excessive, I guess, environmental regulation, then you're a climate change denier and you don't like the environment and I don't know, you hate nature and everything else. Yeah, yeah, I would like to the extent that I'm possible. One of my hugest goals as a candidate and eventually a president is to change the nature of the discourse. The way the country, here's the thing. Yes, politics is always going to be adversarial. People are going to disagree about which interests ought to be prioritized. But there's no reason, and it's incorrect, it's inaccurate, and it doesn't help us resolve anything to make politics about blaming the other guy. So I've heard lots of people, pundits, they tend to say, well, for example, Ben Shapiro, the problem with the left is blah, 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 blah. And if you need to attach a imaginary bad guy to an idea to negate it, in my opinion, you're doing it wrong. I don't need to assign this thing that's wrong to anybody. It, this idea here that we should that we should enter into climate change treaties is wrong. It's wrong for these specific reasons. It's not wrong because the Democrats like it. It's not right because the Republicans don't like it or something. It's it's the reason it's wrong is all those reasons I said. 
Those are the reasons why it's wrong. So, right. what do? All right. Thanks right. for watching so much, everybody. Is, Say again? Well, yeah, my question is, do you actually think the environment is fucked up? And is it more fucked up than it should be? Or is it fucked up in proportion to how it should be due to economic growth? Well, I think it's... I mean, there's no doubt that the global environment is under a great deal of strain. The oceans are under a great deal of strain. And the sections of biodiversity and, and bio, the, the way that large sections of biology play a role in the climate and in the health of the earth as a large ecosystem, those things of, you know, it's like, it, it's not healthy. The, the world's not environmentally healthy. But the thing to note is whether or not, the, how, how messed up is the environment? In the United States, it depends where you go, and generally not so messed up. There's a big difference between litter, which is its own kind of bad thing, and poisoning the water. So the key thing is, what's the environment for? And I'm of a mindset that says, we need to incorporate a model in which it's both for itself, it has intrinsic value that ought to be preserved because as moral agents, we can recognize the value of things not us, including life forms not us. That doesn't mean we need to afford them infinite rights. It doesn't mean we need to be vegans. It just means that we ought respect the fact that as the most highly developed examples of moral agency on the planet, we ought to act like it. That is is not in and of itself a justification for any particular piece of legislation. It's saying, let's have the right attitude about things. Yes, we're here to use the environment for our benefit. And yes, we're the highest, most moral, the, the highest development of moral agency on the planet. So that means we don't just exploit. We understand its value as something that needs to be sustained. And we also don't just we just we don't just preserve we have to balance these things but yeah it, the answer is it's it's that's a tough question to answer why it depends why you want what you're trying to use the environment for in, in a given situation is whether it's really that messed up or not and is it um to a level which is tolerable sorry i can't speak is it to a level which is tolerable i mean I, I'm not looking to make substantial improvements to the environment from the status quo. There are areas of the United States in which they're, they're po they've been poisoned, basically, they're what they call Superfund sites. Uh, and obviously, I'd like to see those things cleaned up. I would love to see any area of public land that's federally owned that is polluted I would think the federal government, had, that's a good thing for the federal government to spend money on. Let's clean that up. That makes sense. Okay. What do you What do you think about opening new national parks? I'm not opposed to it. If, if, there, if there are either federally owned, lands that are already federally owned, or lands that it makes good sense for the federal government to acquire at fair market rates, and if, I, I'm not a big believer in eminent domain, so I would like this new park to push as few citizens off of their property as possible. If they are being pushed out of the property, they definitely need to get fair market value. And, and we ought to try to negotiate with them in a way that it makes it consensual. But provided we could get that land, I would not be opposed to acquiring, for the, the federal government acquiring additional lands to designate parks for. I like open spaces. I like national parks. I believe in them as a, as a resource that's of value. Just the other day, this wasn't a national park, but Kimberly and I went down to the beach we went out onto the pier and we went fishing. In California, you don't need a license for pier fishing. And in California, the state government has put up piers all up and down the coast so that the citizenry can fish in the ocean and have a good day and stuff. That sort of stuff makes a nation a nation. We need that stuff. Um, so what do you think about uh, charging 
citizens to access that land for recreation, whether that's hiking or, or sightseeing or whatever. Yeah, I don't so like that. Are, that I don't like that one okay. bit. Okay, because the thing is here, the federal government is paying for the stuff that the citizens use with our tax dollars. If you want to, if you say, hey. I know, I'm, we're the government. Let's use tax dollars to build this thing so that people can have it and use it. You're not supposed to be doing it for profit. And if it's not sustainable as a tax expense, as a budgetary expense, then you shouldn't do it at all. So it's kind of like the roads here in California as well. We now have toll road, toll lanes on the freeway so that if you want to go in the faster lane, you can pay some extra money and you get to get the fast pass. We already have diamond lanes, which don't do any good, as far as I can tell. My point is, we paid for these roads. Why do the rich people get to, to go in that lane by paying a little bit extra? Or why is it okay for you then to say, well, yeah, you paid for the whole road, but you have to pay extra to use this lane? The tax dollar... Right. The tax dollars are there to fund the government's stuff. They don't they don't need to be then just saying, Well, I know we use all your tax dollars to do this thing, but you still have to pay for it extra again. You have to pay for it again. Well, I already paid for it. Well, pay for it again. No. Yeah, I always found that quite frustrating. But I mean I agree with you. <laughs> My administration may not actually change those rules. I'm not sure. It's probably not going to be a huge priority. But I, if it if it were to land on my desk, I would absolutely sign. Let's get rid of any additional fees stuff. However, having said that, I will concede also that sometimes those fees are used to reduce crowding. Like if we don't charge something, this place is going to be overrun. If we charge something, then It'll reduce the total number of people and it'll preserve the resource for longer. I the thing about that is it may be it may have a good net effect and it may legitimize on, a, on effectiveness grounds, but I still don't like the fact that it's th there's got to be a better way to do that. Well, uh, I'll just give an example. There's a I forgot what it's called, but there's these these waterfalls that you can go to over here in Arizona, and you have to basically sign up by even a year before, I think, in order to go there. There's only a certain number of people that can go there the next season or whatever when it's open, and that's how they limit people going in there and polluting and trashing the environment there, habitat right. and, and ecosystem and whatnot. So I would say that 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 that, that is effective, and I, I don't think it's as I don't know, as um, aggravating or displeasing as charging people money to go. Although I will, I will say that I think they do charge money as well. But you know, you could you could do that same sort of thing without the the monetary aspect to it. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts before we end this video? Yeah, one last one. Hmm. What do you think of Donald Trump leaving the Paris Climate Agreement? Well. I mean, I'm not a big believer in international treaties in general. However, I am a believer in not simply unilaterally deciding that the nation's agreements are null and void. So, I don't like the way Trump does anything. And what matters a lot to me is how things are done. It doesn't mean I don't like the what, the things that Trump does necessarily. There are some things that Trump has done that I might think, well, that's probably a good policy change or something like that. But I don't like the way he has done anything. So in my mind, basically, his way of governance is to try to bypass the mechanisms that comprise the habits of democracy that make the country work as a self-governing entity. Self-governance only works when, when there are procedural constraints on the bodies that exercise that power. And the executive branch in general has 
all of the checks and balances and constraints on the executive branch have eroded away to nothing. More or less, the president can function above the law. You'll see that there are limits to the president's executive orders insofar as Trump's immigration executive orders are having problems in courts right now. But they're having problems for the wrong reason. The courts are saying, no, this won't stand because uh, it discriminates against this party on the basis of religion. Except those people who are being discriminated against on the basis of religion are not American citizens. In fact, they aren't even in the country yet. So that's not a legitimate grounds to invalidate the travel ban. Now, that doesn't mean I support the travel ban as it's done because he's not the legislature. He can't just make up laws and fiat them into existence. Executive orders are contrary to the rule of law when they try to create law. The court should have invalidated the travel ban on the grounds that his use of executive orders exceeded his constitutional, uh, constitutionally provided power. So that sort of thing makes me very upset. Somebody said, well, what's your position on the travel ban, Eric? It doesn't matter. That's not the problem. I mean, it may be a problem to have that travel ban, but it, that's not a question we can even answer yet because that's not a travel ban. That's the president saying, I sure do wish this would be happening. Well, then get Congress to pass a law about it. Then we can talk about the, the merits of that law. The reason the travel ban is bad is because it didn't go through the due process of law that normally would have prevented whatever, especially large wrongnesses, um, are implicit in it. Some people will say, well, what do you think about the issue of Muslim immigration? My position on it is I do believe that we ought to consider the reality of bringing in individuals from a culture that is very misogynistic, that conducts something equivalent to apartheid against women as a general operating procedure in most, as they exist in the, in the status quo countries in the Muslim world. Not all, obviously. But what I'm saying is the average moderate Muslim in the Muslim world is is a representation of a culture that is absolutely opposed to our core values. For example, a core value of Western society is freedom of expression, freedom of conscience. A core value of Western society is equality of rights. So women don't get to drive in Saudi Arabia because they're not considered equal to men and if they say certain things that are insulting to the religion they'll suffer punishments for their free expression. This has been normalized throughout the Muslim world as uh, an acceptable moral calculus. It's not an acceptable moral calculus here and it shouldn't be. The problem with it and the reason why it shouldn't be an acceptable moral calculus is it doesn't pass the reciprocal burdens test. In other words, if the arbitrary reasons you're giving for oppressing those people were given to you by me, if I were oppressing you and giving you those reasons for doing so, equally arbitrary reasons, you wouldn't be okay with it. And so since you're it, members of a culture that don't apply the reciprocal burdens test, to determine the legitimacy of things, bring with them an ideological unfitness. Would I actually, as president, try to ban Muslim immigration? As a general rule, immigration is not going to be a priority for me. I'm not particularly interested in fixing something that's not broken. So immigrants are not actually a problem the Trump administration's contention that they kill people and all this stuff is silly. To the extent that an individual kills another individual, it's that individual who's responsible for the crime, not illegal immigrants. If it is the case that the individual who's responsible for a murder immigrated here illegally, 
That doesn't mean that illegal immigrants are more likely to be murderers. It doesn't mean that we ought to treat illegal immigrants as though they were more likely to be murderers, nor does it mean that we ought to think immigration regulation, if, if we prevent people from coming here, that we're preventing murders. It's also true that if we sterilize everybody and nobody has any more children, that'll really dramatically reduce the murders. But that doesn't mean that childbearing people are responsible for murder because they bear children. That's the logic behind Trump's immigrants kill people nonsense. That's, just, that's the same logic. Well, we'll have, if we don't have as many immigrants here, then fewer immigrants will kill people. Therefore, it's good to not have immigrants. But, but of course, immigrants don't just kill people, right? So some immigrants generate a lot of wealth for the country. Some immigrants provide a good a good parent for some children. Some immigrants, you know, we don't get any of the things that immigrants provide if we don't let immigrants come here. That it does include murder. But just because uh, any given population, some people in that population will commit murder, doesn't mean we should always reduce the population as a whole so as to limit the total overall number of murders while ignoring the fact that we're insane. So, uh, yeah, that's my position on immigration and uh, Islamic immigration, the environment, and other things. Hello, guest. Guest, if you have any questions of a political matter, uh, manner, I'm answering questions on politics right now. If not, <laughs> ENTP who's watched like all your videos. Um, I mean, dude, I could sit here and talk politics with you all day. Um, I'm from Texas, so uh, the perception of um, of immigrants here. I mean, you have uh, I mean you have spectrums like all over the board, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't think that my generation or the younger twenty year old, uh, early twenty mid twenties. Uh, I don't think that we're actually apt enough to, uh, people won't do the jobs. Like, you got to be able to overcome that argument and you can't. Uh, who's going to do it? Um, I think if you lower minimum wage, but there's a lot of different kind of arguments that go with that too. So, um, sorry. <laughs> it's a, it's a practical, uh, that's a practical consideration that is something that factors into immigration. What you're pointing out is that a lot of agricultural interests in the United States use migrant workers. And those migrant workers typically are immigrants and often immigrated here illegally. So one of the problems with cracking down on immigration is in areas of the country where they utilize immigrant labor a lot, they have problems. All of a sudden you've got crops in your field, they're rotting the field, and the, the population of people who naturally has grown up to provide that labor service has been unnaturally removed. So anytime the government interferes in a way like this that takes what is naturally occurring and non-transgressive, namely people living in their communities and and not having certain papers. If you take something that's naturally occurring and not transgressive and you force it to change because it is in opposition to a certain rule, well, then you're prioritizing your approximation of how things ought to work over how they actually work. You're mistaking the map for the territory. So, one of the reasons why we ought to have smart immigration policies, which means something like we had before, when you, you know, there's a certain amount of vetting, there's a certain amount of letting in, we don't want to let everybody in all at once because there are concerns about, you don't want, I'm concerned about population growth in general, there's, uh, there are a finite amount of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of reasons to limit immigration as a whole, but by and large, I'd like to see us can treat immigration as a way to to bring value into the country. And, and you know, it all comes down to perspectives, and it all comes down to uh, uh, why you know, why they're coming here. I mean, look at how look at what grew America as pilgrims and a bunch of people that were willing to kind of go out and go beyond, uh, but to go fight for a better life. And then you have their generations go on and on and on. And we have what do you have? The most powerful nation that the world has ever seen that we've actually. Uh, We've literally been the number one world power, uh, you know, for what, 250 years? Um, that's never happened before. And now, why should you come to America? Well, you come to America to take advantage of welfare. So if you take welfare away, 
Uh, that would take, you know, that, that would literally solve immigration immigrants, right then, you know. Immigrants don't come in for welfare. Because they come in for a better quality of life that they don't have uh, to work for, but they don't have to work for it. Immigrants aren't eligible for welfare, number one. And actually, the federal welfare, welfare programs like they used to be are more or less dead and gone. So we basically have no welfare anymore. And even if we did, immigrants wouldn't be eligible for it. And even if they were, most immigrants immigrate not because they think, oh, you know, here I am in my home and i am got a good job and I'm making lots of money. But, you know, basically I'm pretty lazy. And I hear if I go to America and I fill out a bunch of paperwork, go through a bunch of bureaucratic red tape and get assistance, then I might get some free money from the government. That doesn't motivate anybody to do anything. It's so unreliable. It's like, if you've ever tried to get any kind of thing from the government, even stuff you, that you don't want to get, I don't want to get a driver's license and a car registration, but I was willing to go get it anyway because the government keeps telling me they're going to beat me up if I don't. So I went to go try to do that. But they made it too difficult for me to register my car. So as a consequence, my car is sitting here unregistered, non-operational, because... It's two years out of registration because of California's very complicated smog check plus registration laws. So even though the reason I couldn't get it registered is because even though my car is not a, a bad emitter in terms of exhaust, it's missing a sensor inside of it that they plug something into that gives them a reading. I said, well, can't you actually just test the exhaust? They said, no, we can't do that anymore. But isn't it supposed to be a smog check? Well, yeah. Well, in case you check my exhaust for smog, no. What are you checking then? We're, we're, we, the, the car t gives us a readout. You plug this in, and the car tells us what it's doing. Okay, but but my so back. my readout thing is broken. Well, then your car doesn't pass smog, but it's not <laughs> polluting, right? So this is the sort of thing that happens when you lock into place a bunch of regulatory red tapey kind of shit. Nobody wants to deal with that. And certainly nobody's going to leave their, their country to come get more of that shit. Right? Man, you know, there's a direct correlation between uh, immigration in the U.S. and our de... Uh, I don't know if it's a word. Declination or declining the uh, world rank in, in everything. Literally, it's directly correlated with immigration and uh, in the the lower quality of just everything here in America. And uh, okay, what do you mean by I mean, directly I, correlates? What do you mean by that? I did a so I I, I I wish I had the numbers on me because I know it kind of hurts my validity on it. But no, it uh, I don't need to hear the numbers. I just want to hear you discuss correlation and the quality of the quality. Of, uh, I mean, you know, the immigrants are the reason that we're all here, right? But at the end of the day. Um, the quality of people coming in is not, it's not making our society any better. Well, first of all, immigrants aren't a group of people that, Correct. that we have, we can describe attributes to. It, an individual comes to this country from someplace. And that one individual is a person like you or me. And they either provide value to the country and are a good person. Or they don't. Now, it's possible that we can find statistics that show lower standard of living going, you know, the standard of living going down while total number of immigrants goes up. And you would be correct to say that those, there's a correlation there. But you'd be incorrect to draw any meaning from that correlation because you're talking about a massive, multivariant, chaotic system and there is no possible way to meaningfully link any causal outcome like that and attribute it to increased immigration there's too many variables it's not possible to deconstruct there's too many variables. you're right at the end of the day you're right there's too many variables uh the only thing i was basing that off of was the fact of the the percentage decrease in america on those exact same variables as compared to uh the other nations in the world you know that are going in the same uh, you know, decade that we're in, right? So, like, the, the variables across the globe are the same, um, and we're suffering more in America with the highest immigration numbers 
Um, but then again, there's all these variables that come into play as far as um, what kind of people are coming in and why they're, yeah. So, I mean, it's okay. honestly. Well, the other thing is this, look, <clears throat> we have this tendency to, to come to conclusions about the state of things. So I agree that there are problems with the state of things in America. And I also agree that that's not something that anybody experiences. So nobody experiences the state of things in America. Standard of living may be going down, but you are only, you only care about how it affects you. So if your standard of living is going up, then the state of things might be standard of living going down, but that's not your experience. And the reality is there is no outside description of the state of things that reflects anyone's experience. It's sort of a general like, I'm choosing to frame things negatively because I want to link that negative framing to something to blame. In this case, immigration policy or whatever else. Now, it's possible and certainly reasonable to say that given policies produce specific harms and that, that policy is to blame. But it's m only really meaningful if we're saying this particular law here needs to be repealed. And here's why it's bad. If we try to say our legislative agenda should concern ourselves with how the standard of living is going down and we got to figure out where to place the blame, then that's not going to work because you can never fix any problems that way because you're not describing a real problem. You're, you're saying, here's an approximation of something going on. Real problems are problem. much more specific. I was going to say, I got a good topic on the same uh, conversation. So as the American populace, it's our, you know, we can vote in the rules we vote in essentially conceptually, you know, we, we run the country, right? What is our role as voters of America? Is it to vote for the best? Um, is it for America's well, you know, welfare or is it for our own personal welfare? Uh, and what, um, or what's your opinion on that? Well, my opinion is that they're basically the same thing. So, the the, the obligation of every American citizen, in my opinion, as a patriot, is to vote in this upcoming election. Most politicians will say, your job is to vote. and vote. No, what I'm saying is your patriotic duty is to vote for me in this upcoming election. And the reason is because there is not any other candidate that has anything close to the actual grasp of policy that I have. So... When, if you're listening to this video, you're hearing somebody who's saying, I'm a politician, and the way I'm going to win your vote is by telling you that, and not, not by telling you that, look, I'm with you on your issue. It's by telling you, I will make decisions the correct way. I will respect the constitutional constraint on the government, and I will also respect the law as it is according to court decisions. I will respect the role of the, the executive and I will not exceed the executive's power, while at the same time, I will do my very best to adjudicate every specific issue that comes up that's a real concrete thing that I can address with a specific solution. I will try to do so in the best interest of the country. As often as I can, I will try to do that consistent with a principled constraint. If I can't, I will do so by competing interests. If that's somehow not adequate, then we shouldn't do anything. I'd vote for you all day, man. Thank I'd you. I'd vote for you all day. I appreciate your support. So I'm going to use this opportunity to bring this particular political video that I've been recording here to an end. And I just want to remind everybody, if you have any sense of, let's give idealism one more shot. And for me, I, I sent idealism out the back door a long time ago. I just came back to it in the last five years or so. When I, I realized I had to be purposed, I had to believe in something, I had to advocate what was true and right and just. So if you have in you some faith left in idealism, and if you've supported any kind of politician before, you may have thrown your idealism away as well. I ask you to use that idealism to support my campaign. Because I am actually I I'm actually gonna fix everything. Thanks for watching.